first off, just want to thank everyone for taking the time on a Friday afternoon uh, to listen. You know, obviously, been a lot of market volatility, and we felt it would be a good time. We haven't done one of these fireside chats since all the volatility of the pandemic, um, which we were in the belly of the beast on a couple of those calls, and a lot of you were there with us when the markets were down, in some cases, 40, 50%. I think one of those calls might have been near the bottom of the market. So as you know, Bob and I were used to this kind of volatility and chaos, um, but we thought this would be a really good time just to reiterate, re uh, reiterate excuse me, our message, what we think right now is going on. We've got some great questions we're going to answer, uh, but why don't, Bob, why don't I give you the floor to get started? We've got some great charts here just to, to start off the conference call. So Bob, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Rai. And, and thanks you, everybody, for joining in. Um, you know, we, I put together a, a couple of slides just to put things in perspective. Um, you know, I've always, I always loved going to slides because one picture saves me 3,000 hours of slapping my lips and saves you a lot of um, time and being bored. So let's just go right to the slides, Rye. We'll discuss what we have. We'll address the questions and go from there. Um, <clears throat> this, this is an interesting graph. It goes over 40 years and shows you the calendar year returns for the stock market. Um, and we're using the S&P 500 as the stock market in this instance. And you know, what happens when you have uh, increased volatility, which you know, we've had this year, um, you, know, you always get that question. So Bob, wouldn't it be smarter uh, to get to the sidelines um, and wait till things calm down? And then we'll just work our way back in, which sounds so reasonable. But it's just kind of crazy when you look at this chart because we always have drawdowns in the market. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you look at each year, sometime during the year, the market has a drop, even though it may end up at a much higher level. For example, you know, in 2020 is when the last time we did one of these fireside chats. And it was when the pandemic hit. We were going to have a global recession, right? Um, we we're going to shut down the global economy. And the market dropped 34% in five weeks. As you can see on the right side of the chart, 2020, the yellow is or gold. Is that yellow or gold? Probably I can't tell. Let's go uh, with gold, Bob. Yeah. Because everything you say is gold. gold. Yeah. But the lack of gold down 34%, and we ended up up 16% for the year. Now, I just want to say one thing about this year's volatility. Um, we're now the largest we've ever been. You know, we, we're, we're over a billion dollars in assets under management, thanks to all of you trusting us entrusting us with your assets. We have more clients than we've ever worked with. And if you go back and look at, you know, uh, 2020, <clears throat> when the market declined 34%, we had a lot of people panic out. Um, you know, just say, like, sell everything. Don't call me. Don't talk to me. Just get me out at any price right before the market, you know, reversed and ended up 16% for the year. So yeah. far this year, we've had nobody panic, which is amazing, right? Now, that's good news. The bad news is there's probably going to be a few of our clients who will, which means I think we're going to see more downside volatility from here, uh, at least in a short-term level, a short-term area. But if you look at, you know, down 34%, and of course, hindsight, we're all geniuses, right? I'm a history historian by nature. Um, what should you have done, Rye, when the market was down 34% in 2020? Well, Bob, why? I'd say buy. The market was yeah. up 16% for the year if you just hung in there. Yeah. How about, how about when it was down, you know, 20% in, you know, 2018, right? Or 2019, right? It's like, um, you know, the inclination is to flee when markets decline. And, you know, we've had some really horrible declines. You know, look at the uh, 2008, we were down 49%, right? It was the worst decline and the, the worst uh, economic recession, uh, in our lifetime. And, you know, the markets come way back from then. And again, what, when you look at this chart, when you see the gold, whenever you see gold on the screen, historically, over the last 40 years, where most of us have, you know, been investors, it was a time to buy, not a time to sell. Yeah. And just to mention too, if you look at last year, if you can look, I mean, you kind of have to squint a little bit for 2021. The biggest drawdown we had last year was 5%. So I think, you know, this year's volatility feels a little more striking. Uh, just the fact that we had so little volatility the year prior, right? We got a little bit complacent. But if you look at historically, it's very normal in any given year, you're going to get some sort of drawdown. 
Um, and that's kind of how we see right now, right? This is a very, very typical sell-off you're seeing in an ongoing, what we would still call bull market. And if you go to the next page here, I think, you know, again, what Bob just said, and you hear this all the time, it just sounds so sexy to say, hey, we'll just get to the sidelines when everything feels better, then we'll just jump back in with two feet and, you know, we'll make a lot of money. Uh, but the, the reality of it is market timing is so hard to do. And we've probably shown this chart before, but if you look at the last 20 years, going back to January of 2001, which believe it or not, that's exactly when I got into the business. Technically it was February of 2001. Um, I've been doing this for over 20 years, um, you know, which compared to Bob, you know, I still look like I'm, I'm a novice, but you know, 22 years. 22, Bob's been doing it 22 years. So he's got one year on me. But, you know, the S&P uh, returned 7.47% a year over that time frame, which is a pretty good return. That also factors net in- of inflation too, right? Oh, net of inflation. So it would have been even higher if you factor in uh, the fact that, you know, inflation has taken out that number. Now, what's crazy is if you just took out the best 10 days over 20 years, best 10 days, your portfolio return gets cut in half to 3.35%. You would have been better off sitting in maybe a bond fund or maybe cash over that time frame. Um, and it gets even crazier, right? If you take out the best 20 days, you're down to a 0.69% return. And you can see here, it just gets more abysmal as you take away the best days. So you know, Bob and I, I think we're pretty good at what we do, uh, but be able to, to not miss the best 10 days out of you know 20 years, uh, the probability of that and to be able to, to time that is virtually impossible. Yeah, I think a good uh, good example would be this week. Wednesday, the market was up 935 points. And then yesterday, in case you've been living under a rock, we were down 1,060 points. So the two-day swing was 70 points. Right? Now, on a, you know, on a chart, you, can't hardly, you can hardly see it, but, but you're sitting there, and, you, and yesterday, watching it melt down 1,000 points, felt pretty horrible, but net, net, 70 points. It's, uh, you know, should you have been a buyer or seller? It's kind of hard to tell, right? And the, and the other part I would just mention there too, seven of the best 10 days occur within two weeks of the 10 worst days, meaning the darkest hour is always right before the dawn. And that's the other thing. If we said, let's get out in the cash today, tomorrow could be the day the market just rallies huge and never looks back. And that's exactly what happened during the pandemic. You know, when in March, when the market hit its trough, you know, basically you had the government came out with their stimulus package. And from that moment on, the market went straight up, almost parabolic, frankly, for two years, gave you really no buying opportunities to get back in. So just by missing that first month, I mean, you missed literally like 20% plus worth of returns. You never get that back. So your bigger risk here is you don't know when the market's going to turn the other way. And when it does, it does it with a vengeance. And if you miss that return, as you can see here, it has a dramatic negative impact on your longer term returns. Just to put it in perspective, guys, we had, you know, and this, this is a graph is great, right? So this is, again, just the, the same graph we showed initially. You can see all those red numbers are the drawdown during the course of a year. Um, and on average, on the S&P 500, it's been a negative 14% drawdown on average every year. By the way, we're down 13% on the S&P 500 right now. So this may be you know, all the drawdown for the year, who knows? Um, but if you acted on your impulses, right? If in, in 2020, if you panicked like a few of our clients did and uh, got out and got back in uh, and all of them did. But the difference is from that down 34%, your portfolio went up 21% on your equity side. The people that got out and got back in only made eight. So you can see how that can penalize, your emotions can penalize your return um, that's a huge spread. You never make that up ever. Yeah. Um, and so, and I think the other thing that's interesting is over the, this is 40 years, folks, 40 years or 42 years, 32 were positive. It means the market is up 76% of the time. So even if we have a down year this year, you know, the probability is next year will be better. Um, and the year after will be more positive. So, yeah. you know, as history is a guide, it always tells us that, you know, I'm looking at, what the market actually does year in and year out always gives me confidence to stay fully invested, you know, in our strategy. We, we, we kind of often joke about it. You'll, you might notice that we're, we're often very bullish almost like all the time. Well, if you think of it from an odds and probability standpoint, we're going to be right almost 80% of the time, right? So if you're a gambler, which we're not, 
you're going to the casino and you know you have almost 80% odds uh, that the market's going to go up year after year or you're going to win at the table, um, you're going to take those odds, right? It's very bad odds to bet against the market uh, in any given year because the odds are against you that the market doesn't recover and go higher, but you do have those anomalies over time. So it's good to keep that in mind as well as just from a statistic, statistically, um, you know, essentially you have way more up years than you do down years. And that's why it pays, you know, Bob's talked about this in the past, you know, an optimist, optimistic investor uh, outperforms a negative investor just because odds and probabilities are markets tend to recover and go higher over time. You know, they don't stay down. Now, I know on the financial news, the popular subject is uh, we're in a recession, which is kind of shocking since we created 400,000 jobs today. Um, that's not recessionary. Um, you know, you hear all these what if scenarios, right? Well, now that uh, Russia's invaded Ukraine, well, it's, you know, China's going to invade Taiwan. Now, clients don't call me and say it might happen. They say, Bob, China's invading Taiwan. What are we going to do about it? Right? There's this certainty that everything's going to end up, um, you know, on, on the wrong side. So, you know, there's all possibilities, right? There's, but there's always uncertainty. Um, and even if we're wrong about our optimistic outlook right now, by the way, we don't believe we're heading into a recession. We don't believe we're in a recession. Um, that two thirds of the economists that are surveyed don't believe we're going into a recession. So, you know, news media, they, they like to sell news and advertising. They, they do believe it. But even if we're wrong, what if we're wrong? What if we go into a bear market? What if we go into a recession? Um, you guys just lived through one, right? You just went through a bear market and lived through that recession. And um, you went through the worst one of your lives just in 2008. If, you know, remember the Great Recession, the Great Financial Crisis? Well, here's the thing about bear markets. So on the left side of this graph, you have 13 bear markets, you know, since 1929. The average duration, the average time of those bear markets is 22 months. And the average decline is 42%. Yeah, it hurts. Ouch. But you went through that. Most of you who are with us in 2007, 2008, you saw the market go down almost 60%, <clears throat> but it was over in 17 months. So what if you're, you retired into that, right? What if you're about to retire? What if you're about you know, to do something momentous in your lifetime? It didn't last your lifetime. It lasted 17 months, right? So you know, remember, our portfolios generate a lot of income, a lot of dividends, a lot of interest. Even if you had an evade principle, in 2008, 2009, to meet your lifestyle goals, the market recovered. And it doesn't recover a little bit, right? Look what happens in bull markets. And let's look what happened in your experience, right? Since paying capital started back in, in 2009, the market went up 144 months. We had a 401% return. So even if we're wrong, right, about this decline, it's going to be over shorter than you think. And the bull markets way outweigh the bear markets. Um, but meanwhile, you know, like I said, the market's down 14%, which is the average, right? We're down 13% right now. None of your portfolios are down that much, by the way. Um, matter of fact, without last Friday and yesterday, you know, most of the portfolios are only down a couple of percent. Now, we had a big drop um, in every financial asset, but your portfolios are not down as much as the market. And that's what's called outperformance. Um, now, the thing that I, you know, I live by, and this is something that I wish somebody had shown to my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents, because if they had, uh, chances are I'd be living off of a gigantic trust fund because all my great grandparents, parents and grandparents had to do was put some money in the market because the market has gone up for 100 years. Uh, not a little bit. You know, it's been the greatest wealth creator in the history of the planet. Um, now we lived through, and a lot of you lived through it with me when I was at Merrill Lynch and Ryan was at Merrill Lynch, um, in the eighties, well, not Ryan, but not until after that, but in the eighties and the nineties, we had what's called a secular bull market where market has this huge bull run with mini cyclical declines, kind of what we've been experiencing now, you know, since uh, 2009. So I still believe we're in a big booming secular bull market. Um, and you can see, you know, even with the, you know, you can see the, the big decline um, that, that come, you know, in, in, in the history of, of, of the markets, it's, you can hardly see, you know, where the 2008, um, you know, Great Recession was. I mean, look at that on the chart. You know, in the terms of yeah. history, it's, it's barely a blip on the screen. 
So, you know, one of the things that I think that we, we, we try to do with our diversified strategy is to keep you invested, is to keep us emotionally calm. Um, and as an added, you know, just to add to that, that's why we're doing this call, just to remind you that over time, market's always right, market always wins. And, you know, the, the longer we're in, the better. So the, um, and the next chart is the, is a breakdown. Yeah. It came out a little blurry, sorry guys, but Brian, you can talk to yeah. this, please. Yeah, so I think the other the other thing you're hearing right now is is we're in this bear market, right? And a bear market is you're down 20% plus. And there's only one one part of the market right now that's getting like kicked in the teeth, for lack of a better way of putting it. And that's really your growth disruptive technology. In fact, the Nasdaq, which is composed of a lot of technology stocks, um, you know, a lot of these more the new economy as we'd like to call it. That's what they called it back in the, in 2000 when we had the tech bubble burst. You're kind of seeing something similar to that now where tech's down over 20%, that that ARC fund, Kathy Woods, who's always on CNBC, you know, she owned all the winners like Zoom, Teladoc of, of the pandemic, that her, her returns were over 100% one year, is now down over 65% from peak to trough. And you know, this is one of the keys to our strategy. And a lot of you who have been clients of ours for many years probably recognize this. And this just shows you over the last 20 years, each column goes from 2006 all the way to two, uh, to year to date, this goes till 2021. And it ranks each year, what did the best down to what did the worst. And you can see here that the best place for your money to be is always changing. And Bob mentioned that we, we have outperformed the market this year, we're not down as much, is because one component to your portfolio that we've had for years, and it's been a horrible place to be for many years, were commodities and energy pipelines. In fact, clients begged me to sell them over the last decade because we held them since we started our firm and we refused to sell them, and now they're dramatically outperforming everything else. So commodities this year up over 30%. Our energy pipelines are up 30%, and both of them were up almost 25 30% last year. So cumulative 50%. And because they're very, very inflationary. Um, and one thing we've always believed, and you can see here commodities year to date, if you look at that brown uh, colored box there on the upper right, uh, all the way to your right-hand side, you know, which if you look at commodities over the last decade, those brown boxes were at the bottom for a long time. But the one thing we've always been aware of, and we've always been very adamant when it comes to your portfolio, is never overweight any part of the market, any sector. And we saw this really the last couple of years because growth, large cap tech, uh, disruptive technology did so well that not only did clients or, or you know, families that were coming into our firm to have us analyze their portfolios were overweighted there, but Wall Street does the same thing. They, you know, they, they tend to put money what's been the hottest asset class. And now you're starting to see that part of the market not only sell off a little bit, it's selling off dramatically. And that's really critical because your portfolios have a limited amount of exposure to the parts of the market that are getting whacked the most here, for lack of a better way of putting it. And that's because we adhere to that diversification at all times. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Ray. And then we'll be um, this. All right, here you go, Bob. Floor is yeah, yours. So that, that, you know, the, um, and let's face it, if, if I had a crystal ball and I knew exactly which one of those style boxes was going to outperform for the rest of our lives, then why wouldn't we put all your money there, all right? We don't know. Diversification is not about certainty. It's about... It's about weighing against uncertainty, right? It's how to win against uncertainty. Um, we diversify your portfolios so that we can weather these storms, keep you invested, and achieve your goals. And you know, over, you know, over the last 20 years, you know, basically a balanced portfolio of you know stocks to bonds has given us a positive return. You know, in in, in case of, of paying capital, close to 10% a year. You know, since we since we opened our doors. Um, one of the things that's happening this year, which you've never had to experience before, is interest rates going up. So your bond values are down. Um, but the key to our bond portfolio is that we own all the individual bonds. That's why you know I'm still known nationally as the anti-bond fund advisor. Um, and we don't have you in bond funds. We have you in individual bonds because all bonds mature at par, right? So even though our bonds are down now, they eventually will not be down. We'll eventually get 100% of our money back with interest. And each asset class that we have in your portfolio, you know, provides a, you know, a different, um, you know, a different diversification, a, a different weighting. 
Um, you know, we have real estate in your portfolio, which is, you know, protects against inflation. We have pipelines, which protects against inflation. We have commodities, which protects against inflation. But the ultimate hedge against inflation is to own bonds that are high quality, that not only give you interest, but give you a return to your principal. Um, now, when I look at my bond portfolio, I look at a bond portfolio right now, it doesn't feel that way, but it's going to happen. Um, you know, all bonds mature at par. And um, so what you see is what we need to do is to stay invested because there's no way to time these things. Um, there's no way to time it correctly. And, you know, I know, look, I, I, I reduced a lot of your exposure in 2007. Those of you who are my clients. Hardest thing in the world was getting you back in. Because once you're out of the market, you start to realize there's a lot of uncertainty. And then you use that uncertainty for a reason for never, ever to invest again. And, you know, you have friends, you probably have family members, you know, who always talk about, you know, one day I'm going to get invested. They're waiting for the all clear signal. And, you know, there is no magic formula. There is no, there is no magic signal. Um, so you have to be invested. Now, one of the things that we will do this year, and we can't really do it in your equity portfolio because you have no losses. Um, but we will do some bond swaps, right? We will do, we will work on creating losses, right? You can do a swap um, like we've done in equities in the past years and put what we call losses in the loss bank because most of you have enormous unrealized capital gains in your equity portfolio. We'll be taking some of those down the line. And when we do, we don't want you to pay that much to the IRS. We want you to pay yeah. the least possible, all right? So these are some strategies our advisors will be talking to you about. Um, so why don't we go to, we had a lot of great questions come in. Bob and I are going to try to cruise through these for you. So we'll keep, uh, we'll keep it tight. Uh, but we had some really good ones. And I'm going to start with the top one here, Bob, and we'll go right down the line. But the first question came in from Dan. He writes in, I recently watched your video posted on paincm.com. Thank you. You mentioned commodities. And I wondered if you had any suggestions for a good way to play that through an ETF or exchange traded fund. Any words you provide will be greatly appreciated. Note, I realize you don't have a crystal ball. Well, I'm not sure if you're a client or not, but you know, commodities are a component to our portfolio, and we do own them in an ETF. We own the, the BCI Commodity Index, which if you're a client, um, if you own that right now, that's again up over 32% this year. And what I like about that, it's a basket of commodities. So we're, we're not making any bet on any specific commodity, whether it be gold, whether it be agriculture. Uh, whether it be oil, we own all of them in that basket. And again, because we're in higher inflationary territory, like Bob mentioned, if you look at it historically, commodities are a great inflation hedge. And this is why we've always owned them in our portfolio. And they're acting as a tremendous hedge in the portfolio this year, because it's all part of our longer term design of literally owning everything, depending, no matter what happens in the market, we have something in place that should be working in your portfolio. Bob, anything you want to add question comes from Ron. He says, uh, you know, several advisors on Fox Business News are saying for now, the U.S. is the place to be for equity investing. Are you of the same opinion? Hey, Ron, first of all, don't trust anybody that's ever on TV. Except, yeah. oh, sorry, Ryan. <laughs> Especially on I, Fox. I, 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 minute, Not Chris, credible. Did I, did I say that? Uh, other than Ryan. All right. When Ryan's on, trust him. Um, and by the way, everybody knows that he's on Fox Business every Tuesday morning, and uh, you also see some other advisors on CNBC and Fox. But, you know, I, I think that's everybody has a home bias. Um, I remember 20, 20 years ago reading in a financial planning magazine about this billionaire in Taiwan who um, his, his financial advisor said, you should diversify your portfolio. And he says, what do you mean? He goes, every stock you own is a company headquartered in Taiwan. He goes, well, where else would I put money? He said, how about the U.S. market? He goes, oh, no, that place is risky. So, you know, I think we all have this home bias that the U.S. is the place to be. But as a result of outperformance from the U.S. in the last 10 years, it's now 62 percent of the world's stock market capitalization, even though we're only 26 percent of the world's GDP. Uh, there's lots of opportunity outside of the U.S. We, you got everybody has a waiting in developed capital markets in, in non-U.S. stocks and emerging markets. Rai, you've got some comments on that that uh, you just mentioned the other day. Yeah, I would just say just briefly, um, if actually you look at last month in local currencies, uh, the foreign markets actually outperformed the U.S. markets. So, you know, this year, they're not actually underperforming the U.S., um, which you would think from watching the news. In fact, remarkably, we actually had a negative GDP growth in our first quarter. Uh, Europe did not. Even with higher gas and oil prices, they actually had a, a small, but they actually had a positive GDP for last quarter. 
and valuations are much cheaper overseas, which again, as interest rates go up, we have you know higher higher inflation. You want to own cheaper valuated valuation uh, valuated stocks rather. So that's something to keep in mind. But yeah, it's a big component to our portfolios. We're big believers. Uh, the next question that comes in is from John. He writes in, "Why are my equities and bond accounts both declining in this crazy market? Should we maintain a 60-40 equity to bond ratio, or move up to 70-30 ratio, or something else?" By the way, Aaron Dessen, who's an advisor of ours, is great. We agree. Aaron is amazing. He's one of our fantastic certified financial planners. Um, well, I say first off, right, bonds are down because interest rates are up. Um, but again, we don't own a traditional 60-40 portfolio, right? Because that 60 isn't just in stocks. We have commodity exposure, which is up big this year, as we just mentioned. We had energy pipelines, which are up huge this year. In fact, if any of your value exposure um, is pretty much flat for the year. It hasn't gone down this year. So, you know, by owning a lot of different asset classes, you know, we've been able to, to go down less than the market has this year, even with bond prices down because of that extra diversification. And Bob, anything you want to add there? Yeah, the whole, uh, <clears throat> all of your target asset allocations are built, give you the highest probability of overcoming inflation and taxation and achieving, achieving your retirement and, you know, your ultimate goals um, by taking the least amount of risk or the least amount of volatility. So we don't think at this point you want to radically change your allocation. What you want to do is maintain it. Um, I'll give some kudos to my son, Chris, who's on the screen. Uh, I remember during the uh, pandemic uh, decline, he was visiting me and we were, we were on the phone with clients. And he said, well, we're going to take 5% of your bonds, which are up, and move it to equities, which are down 35% right now. And he said, all right, Chris, that sounds great. He said, but what if it doesn't work? He says, what do you mean? He says, what if the market goes down further? He said, well, then we'll do it again. Oh, okay. Well, what if that doesn't work? And then we'll do it again. He goes, well, when will we stop doing it? He says, until we don't have mm -hmm. to. And you know, as you all know, as we have history, uh, we only had to rebalance your portfolios once during the pandemic and the market just turned around and went straight up. Um, that outperformed everything anybody else did in our industry. So again, <laughs> it's all about staying invested in a diversified strategy. Um, and this way we're you know, we're able to combat uncertainty. And that's really what diversification is about. Yeah. Uh, next question comes in from Rocco. He writes, in recession looks inevitable for 2023. Would you sell now and wait it out? Well, hopefully, based on our comments today, no. And I think this is an important point. It's not inevitable that we're going into some sort of recession. In fact, even in Europe, it's not a foregone conclusion. You know, I think it's got to be very careful with these media headlines. As Bob mentioned, any of those people on TV, you shouldn't trust them. Um, you know, but the point is, you know, we don't really know that. And most economists don't think we're going into recession. And I'll just mention just really quickly here, two things. Number one, inflation is probably going to come down this year, even though, again, the media is paying this picture like it's going to be like the 70s hyperinflation. Um, we're not going to be able to keep up with inflation. The reality of it is a lot of these supply chains are getting fixed. We're already seeing like used car sales come down. Um, you know, Beijing and China is not going to be locked down forever. So a lot, of those, a lot of those issues are going to get fixed. Meanwhile, and Bob just mentioned today, you know, the employment numbers were huge. We're down to 3.5% unemployment. That's a 50-year low. People have money in their pocket, about $2 trillion still left over from the pandemic, and their wages are going up. And we're not seeing the consumer spend, you know, slow down their spending here in the US. And the US consumer literally drives everything. So our viewpoint is there's a really good chance we're not going into recession in the next 12, 24 months. 30 months, I don't know. You know. I don't know how some of these economists think they can predict out that far. So I'd be very careful there. And again, it's very dangerous. You know, Things could turn on a dime here. And more importantly, sitting in cash, you're earning nothing right now. You lost 8% of your purchasing power the last 12 months. Um, and you, know, you need to get a return on your money. You need to get your money compounding. And that's why it's so critical to be invested here. Just let me add to that. Anything is possible. All right. I mean, it's just anything is possible. Uh, Jupiter may hit Mars tonight. It's possible, all right? Not probable. But we invest your money based on probabilities. Um, and I think one thing that I, I, I get, I've gotten this question over my 47 years, it's like, Bob, what, what happened? We, we could go to zero. Well, first of all, no, no market is ever going to zero. That's why we use broad indices, right? That's why you own a piece of 10,000 individual stocks in your portfolio. And that's why we don't buy individual equities because an individual company can go to zero. Like the one Ryan I used to work for, Merrill Lynch can go to zero. And it really is a bummer when you own the stock. Um, 
And we own high quality bonds, which, you know, there's always a chance of the fall of the bond, but with high quality bonds, it's very, very minimal. Um, and that's why we manage these portfolios. And the worst that's going to happen with that money is you're going to get your money back. So the key is anything is possible, but we want to invest your money based on what's probable. That gives you the highest opportunity yeah. and the highest uh, chance of, of achieving the returns that you need to achieve, which is why you're, you know, in these different yeah. markets. Yeah. Avoid an all or none strategy because, you know, there's no all or none scenario. If there is, you're hundred percent right or hundred percent wrong. That's a bad place to be as an investor. Uh, the next thing I want to mention, it's, um, you know, last year, this is, this is the thing that blows my mind. Uh, January 4th, we are at an all time record high in your portfolios. Right. Think about that gang. We came into this year as all time record high. So last year I can guarantee it. Nobody called me to say, Hey Bob, should we get to the sidelines, make some money off the table? But we also had last year, one of the greatest investors in the history of the world, Warren Buffett, say, hey, I can't find anything to invest in. That's why we have so much cash. Now, last quarter, right, we had a down quarter. We had the worst quarter, the worst start to the market uh, for the four years since 1970. Warren Buffett invested $40 billion into the market. All right. So, you know, last year when the market was at all time record high, he sat on his hands. Now he's buying. What do you think we should be doing? Yes. Yeah, exactly right. He bought more in the last quarter, um, which brings us to our next question. Franz writes in, greetings, gentlemen. You sure he's talking about us, Bob? I don't think we've ever been referred to as gentlemen before. Uh, do you recommend I bonds? And if not, what type of bonds or dividend paying stock funds or ETFs do you recommend? Thank you. Well, I bonds are good, except for you're, you're limited to what you can buy. Uh, you know, they grow tax deferred or they, the income doesn't pay right out. It, 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 it accrues. So for a limited amount, it's not a bad solution. But um, if, you're, if you're a client of our firm, you know we like bonds that come due, that pay interest. And if you look at our institutional portfolios right now, we're seeing the best yields on them that we've seen in a decade. You're getting almost 4% on our taxable core bond portfolio, yield to maturity. And get this, if you're in a tax-free portfolio now, the yield to maturity is over three, almost three and a quarter percent. That's like you getting almost 5% on your money for a bond that comes due that's A-rated over the next 10 years. So you know, bond yields have become extremely attractive with this big interest rate hike. And again, you're taking a lot less risk in the bond market because your money comes due. Yeah, I think that they, you've seen a lot of headlines on the I-bonds. And um, I have a great article. If anybody would like to see it, email me. I'll send it to you. But um, the thing is, the interest rate changes, right? You, you're, you say you're going to get 10% on, on uh, starting in June. But again, it's, it's a 30-year bond. Um, you can sell some after one year. If you sell any within five years, you got a three, three, three month interest penalty. And by the way, the interest rate is not set. In 2015, what would you guess the rate was? How about zero? So, you know, it's, um, sounds, it, it, you can only put 10,000 in. You have to go to the Treasury Direct. You can't buy it in a brokerage account. And a lot of people have done that. They went to Treasury Direct and bought it and forgot to file their tax return. And now you got to pay a penalty on the interest they accrued, which they didn't actually get. So, you know, they're out there. Something that if anybody wants to know more about, I'd be happy to send them info. Yeah. And just to mention, all of our ETFs are paying very attractive dividends right now. Um, everything from value stocks to the emerging markets paying over 3%. Our pipeline index pays like 5%. Real estate pays over 3 to 3.5%. Three so, you know, the market right now is just cash flow rich. And again, in an inflationary environment, you want that cash flow coming in that you can compound. Uh, the next question coming in, we should probably cruise here a little bit. Uh, is Michael writes in, do either of you favor selling equities at this time or just riding this carnage out? In other words, is this a correction at the beginning of a bear market? Well, I think you know where we stand at this point. We've, we view this as a correction and an ongoing bull market. Um, this is not the, the beginning of a, of a huge tumultuous downturn. Uh, next question that comes in is from Ray. He writes in, Bob and Ryan, should we be moving some of our assets into gold and silver or are the diversified investments appropriate for any season? Good question, Bob. Why don't you go for it? Yeah, well, first of all, we own gold and silver in the commodity basket. Um, our diversified portfolio is a market for all seasons, right? It is a portfolio for all seasons. Yes, our growth portfolios are down so far this year, but they also generated close to you know 18% a year return for most of us over the last uh, 13 years. But you know, it's something else you might want to might not have noted, but two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, three weeks ago, our large company value portfolio and our mid company value portfolio, those ETFs were not just at a new high, they were at an all time record high. 
right? So you do have things that are going up while other things are going down. You know, we have truly diversification where, where something's working, something else isn't. Um, here's what I'd like you to all recognize. Every year, if there's something in the portfolio you don't hate, then I want you to fire me because that means we're not doing a good job. You can't have everything going up at the same time um, and you're not having everything go down at the same time. Although it might feel like it right now, yeah. um, different parts of the portfolio are actually near their all-time record high right now. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So it's, again, it's uh, think about it on a spectrum, right? There's different returns come from different parts of the market, growth down huge, with commodities over here going up huge and everything else is along that spectrum. Um, this, con this question comes in from Constantine, uh, the midterm elections approach, what influence will changing the majority party in the House and Senate have on the stock market? In my opinion, both parties are equally corrupt. I agree. <laughs> Obviously, Biden and Harris will serve two more years with his obvious dementia and her obvious incompetence. Could be true. The market responded favorably to increased interest rates on Wednesday. Your comment. Um, I'll just say one thing. I mean, we've had a lot of gridlock. And gridlock has been fantastic for the markets. If you remember when the Biden administration came in, we heard all this talk about we're going to see higher taxes. We're going to see unrealized, cap unrealized capital gains, but they're still trying to push through being taxed. But what we've seen is a lot of the, the more aggressive uh, tax proposals have just gone by the wayside. And even some of the more aggressive stimulus, like they had that Build Back America plan, it was like $5 trillion. So, so most of the more aggressive uh, policy so far hasn't come through. And we see more of that, Bob, I'll let you add to that. Well, Dean, we've studied this issue. And over the last 40 years, as you saw from the uh, slides presentation, you know, the market's going up. Half the time, there was a Democrat in the White House. The other half the time, there was a Republican in the, in the White House. So I've concluded that the market always goes up as long as someone's sitting in the White <laughs> House. It doesn't matter if they're red or blue. Um, and what we found is we don't want ever to have our political beliefs influence our investment decisions. We found that that really uh, is a problem. If you take, I mean, we don't have time to do it today, but we have a great graph that shows when Obama was in the White House, Republicans said the economy was horrible. And, and then when, um, you know, <clears throat> when Bush was in the White House, the Democrats said the economy was horrible. It's, it's just, you know, a lot of people, they just put on that filter We've got to look at it with a cold eye and, you know, we have to look at you know, valuations and that's what's really important. And I think that, um, like Ryan says, gridlock is the best. So anybody who follows politics, pray for gridlock. That's good for, that's good for bull markets. <laughs> Our next question comes in from Don. He writes in fixed income holdings. to understand 10 year treasuries went from 1.5 to 3%, which is a hundred percent move upwards, by the way, it's a lot. I understand duration short and midterm pieces will be repaid and replaced with higher yields. Why did uh, the bond manager continue to hold long-term pieces with huge losses? Like Microsoft down big, 50%, uh, excuse me, 25%, AT&T down 19%, total fixed income portfolio down about 10%, um, which is probably a little less than that, but close to that. So what's the point of earning 3% if you're losing 25% principal with repayment at par many decades off? And won't losses grow as interest rates further increase? What reasons are you to stay with this program? Okay, this is, this, this is specifically talking about our bond portfolio. And, and the first thing that I would say, and Bob, I'm going to hand it off to you, is you got to remember, it's not like stocks. Those bonds do mature at par. So even if you have a loss on your bond, at some date in the future, you get your principal return and you continually get your interest. Secondly, I would say is, we don't know how much higher interest rates are going to go here. You have to remember the Fed is behind what the market's doing. So the market's already pricing in higher interest rates ahead of time. So even if the Fed keeps raising interest rates, you know, the market at this point, they, they could be tapped out. You know, this could be the highest interest rates go. We don't know that. So again, you just can't make that assumption that interest rates are going to go a lot higher here. We could very well, well be at the higher end where interest rates are going to go. Hey, Don, it's a great question. I really understand the concern. Um, and I think a lot of advisors... Um, we're younger than me, most are, have never seen interest rates go up. I mean, we've been in a 40-year bull market in bonds and, uh, you know, and a bear market in interest rates. Well, that's reversed. Um, now, remember, our portfolios are intermediate. You know, they're not 30 years, right? So it's interest rates. The Fed keeps creating interest rates. It's really going to impact the longer end of the curve. Um, like Ryan said, the short to intermediate may have already peaked. We don't know. 
Uh, but meanwhile, we're getting that interest. We're going to reinvest that interest at a higher level. Some of your shorter term bonds are going to be rolled out into higher coupon bonds to give you a higher rate of return. And if any of your bonds are in a taxable account, we're going to encourage our bond manager to do tax swaps. Hey, my first 10 years in the industry, I started in 75. For 10 straight years, I never made money in a bond. All right, only date is the interest. Every year I would swap a bond, right? sell it at a loss and buy a bond that was similar so that one day down the line, I get all my money back. But that way I've got good high you know, current income. Right now, the current income on the bond portfolio is excellent. And it's, um, you know, it, it, again, the duration on the portfolios are the shortest they've ever been um, of all the years we've been managing bonds. And the worst that will happen is over that period of time, whether it's a five-year, six-year duration between the interest that you're earning and the bonds that come due, you're going to get 100% of your money back with interest. Um, it's still going to outperform cash, in my opinion, although it hasn't so far year to date. But, you know, cash is zero. Um, it's been zero, maybe zero for a while. It's a very, it's a necessary evil in the portfolio. Um, these are the best bond managers in the country. And the track record is excellent. And we may suffer a down year, but I think yeah. that, that'll be about it. Um, moving to the next question here, we're getting the home stretch here. We had a lot this time around. Is there downside protection built into our portfolios? If there is, why isn't it working? It is working. Um, if you look at the average paying capital portfolio, it's down like seven, eight percent as of today. The S and P is down fourteen percent. So you know bonds are down right now, and again, a lot of that's temporary because bonds do come due, which is rare to have your bonds and your stocks down at the same time. But because of the commodity exposure, because we have value stocks, which haven't gone down this year, you're still down almost half what the market is. And again, that speaks to diversification and that all weather portfolio that we build, because we just always assume that things are going to change. Um, and same thing about international markets is good. You know, that's a good point there is like international markets have underperformed for the last decade, the decade before. I remember that's when I started in the business. All anyone could talk about is how the U.S. was dead. The only action is overseas in the emerging markets and international markets. And that was true for a decade, just like last decade, it was the U.S. is king. That's going to continually change. And that's why our diversification you know, should continually work. Bob, you want to end anything there? No, it's just funny. Like when we started paying capital management, right? When you left Merrill Lynch in 2008 and um, you know, we, we started investing all of your money in the portfolio that you have today, uh, People fought us tooth and nail. Say, we don't want that much in the U.S. market. We want more emerging markets. We want more international. Um, you know, it, it, it's amazing how markets are cyclical, and you're gonna, every decade has a different outperformer. You know, past performance is 100% indicative of past performance. It tells you nothing about the future, uh, which is another reason why we stay, you know, so yeah. diversified. <laughs> and um, we think that um, you know. The future is going to be value versus growth, small versus large, international versus U.S. But I might be wrong about that. So I'm going to keep some money in the other areas just, just, to, just to make sure we're covered. Yeah. Um, next question comes in from Greg. Assuming a global recession is inevitable, again, uh, does it really make sense for a retiree to avoid market timing in advance of the train hitting the wall? So it goes back to what you've been saying. Again, we don't know if recession is inevitable, but the dangers of market timing here uh, are too great because if you get out of the market, it turns on a dime. And again, no one's going to anticipate it ahead of time, especially those on the financial media, I'll add. Um, you know, it's so important to stick to your strategy, especially in these more volatile times. Bob, anything you want to yeah, add? That's a great question. You know, I understand it as I, I've been trying to retire now for 10 years and my, my sons won't let me, but um, <laughs> I am retired. I just haven't signed a paperwork in case anybody's wondering. But the, um, you know, you look at your portfolio and you wonder, right? It's like, you know, oh, what, what's going to happen if we have this global recession? Well, we just did. 2020, we had a global recession. And what happened? We made a ton of money. So I think that um, I think that's a great lesson, recent lesson to understand how markets work. But more importantly, we have the portfolio structured in a way. And when we do your wealth projections and e-money and, and your annual reviews, we look at you know how much money you need to live on. We, we basically project your portfolios to make a 5% return, even though we've done way better than that. Um, and almost half of that return, maybe five eighths, comes from dividends and interest. So if you're sitting in cash, you're not getting half of your return that you need to achieve your goals. And with a lot of you now in municipal bond yields going up and on a after tax or pre tax basis, you know, we can get you to your goals just 100% in bonds, which we're not going to recommend. But the thing is that dividends and interest are critical. It's half the return. 
It's that compounding yeah. dividend in and interest that have made all the wealth and created all the wealth that we created over the last 13 years. Yet that's the secret sauce. Can't get dividends and interest if we're sitting in cash waiting to see what yeah. happens. Yeah, it's all proverbial. It's time in the market, not timing the market. And there's no truer words because every day you're invested, you're accruing those dividends and interest. That's the magic to investing. And that's what you can't avoid. If you're sitting in cash, the opportunity cost is greater than ever because cash pays literally nothing in an 8% plus inflationary environment. That's The stakes are way higher than they were the last decade when inflation was really low. Uh, the next question that comes in is from Scott. At 64 years old, retiring in another year, what percentage of my portfolio should be in more conservative vehicles? Um, well, if you're a client of our firm, you know the way we come up with that uh, allocation is by looking at your goals, Scott. So we want to reverse engineer, look at, okay, how much income do you need? How much growth do you need on your portfolio? And then we can determine what goes into fixed income, uh, what goes into a diversified portfolio in the market. But all that should be customized to you and what your needs are specifically. There's no real good rule of thumb there, but I will say this, because you're being close to being dependent on your portfolio, you don't want to be 100% exposed to the stock market uh, just because the amount of certainty there is like zero. Bob, anything you want to add there? No, I agree, right? A to B. A to B. Beautiful. That's the, that's the bread and butter of pain capital management. All right. The last question here comes in from Peter. He writes in, giving rising risk of recession, what are your top three investment categories to consider through 2022? Um, I would say you know, right off the bat here, again, we don't know if it's inevitable, but if we do go into a recession, we could, absolutely could go into it. You got to remember, stocks are a great inflation hedge, right? As, as costs go up, revenues for companies go up because they raise their prices, which in effect means they raise their earnings and they raise their dividends, which they pay out to you and me. Commodities historically are a great inflation hedge, which we have in our portfolio. And real estate, we own real estate investment trusts in our portfolio. Remember, rents go up. Um, you know, Leases, they, 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 go in, they come in at much higher numbers. So we own those three stools. And then Bob also, I would say, our institutionally bond managed account because our bonds come due. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, whether we have a high risk of recession or not, um, the portfolio that we have and it's designed is really an all weather portfolio. It's working as advertised. It's done it year in and year out. Um, I couldn't be happier with where we are right now. You know, uh, one of my mentors at Merrill Lynch told me that, you know, the one of the top 10 things to remember when it comes to investing is that bull markets are much more fun than bear markets. Yeah, I hate declines. But you know, without declines, there's no opportunity. And without opportunity, there's no, um, you know, there's, there's no equity premium. There's no premium to investing in risk assets. We might as well sit in gold or cash. Uh, we, we want to embrace this volatility. We're not going to sit back and just hold your hand and say, oh, everything's going to be fine. We're going to take action, right? We're going to if we see losses, we're going to take losses. We're going to do tax swaps this year. We're going to keep you in a position to win. And right now, I can't think of a better portfolio strategy than the one we have and the way it's working right now. Um, I don't know what's going to be up big next year, right later this year, or what's going to be our worst performer. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have them. But, uh, you know, our advisors are here to take your questions and uh, address your concerns. And, you know, Ryan and I, uh, we'll, we'll continue to do our podcast. Hopefully, everybody tunes into our podcast. We're on episode 81 or two now. And, uh, you know, and make sure you're getting our market commentary every week to see what our latest thoughts are on what's happening with your yeah. portfolio. Um, we did get two more questions in the chat, which we'll answer here. We oh. have a couple more minutes. Um, might okay. as well take them. And I you know, just, you know, that's that too is just, you know, the one thing I hope you get comes across here is Bob and I and, and our advisors, we think a lot about this. Um, and that's why we're putting content out every single week, because we really do take this serious that you've really entrusted us with your money. So we're constantly thinking of every angle, every situation that could possibly happen um, and how we design your portfolios. Um, you know, so it's, it's really important to us that, that we are thinking about this all the time and we are constantly on top of what's happening next and you know, how we can be ahead of the curve and not behind the curve. And this actually ties into this question here. Um, this is from Don here. He says, you mentioned NASDAQ and large cap growth taking a beating. I think I said kicked in the teeth. Uh, if markets do come back later this year, will they have a bigger bounce upward? Seems uh, too late to get out of the ETF, such as the QQQ. I'd say not necessarily. And we saw this when the tech bubble burst. Um, you remember like growth stocks, tech languished for like 15 years. And here's the analogy I'll give you on that. It's kind of like the tide's down. You're in the NASDAQ, you're in growth stocks, you're in a boat that's got lots of leaky holes. It's about to sink. 
And over here, we have the sturdier vote. We'll call it the pain capital vote because, you know, we like to put a commercial in here once in a while. Um, you know, we have commodities in there. We have emerging markets. We have international markets. We have bonds that come due. When the tide rises again, that sturdier boat, uh, there's a good chance is going to do better because when you have volatility like this, the leadership tends to change. So with the markets down here, it's a good time to re-diversify and not just sit on your losers. Um, or if you're over-concentrated in growth, I wouldn't just sit there and hope for the bounce. I'd get re-diversified now because when we get that bounce, there's going to be a lot of parts of the market that did nothing. And commodities are an example of that. They did nothing. And then all of a sudden, after the pandemic, they turned on a dime unexpectedly. Now they're dramatically outperforming everything. So I would urge you to get re-diversified while the markets are down. Don't wait because uh, growth, it could be dead money for a long time. Historically, that's happened. Anything you want to add to that, Bob? No, I mean, we don't own the QQQ in our portfolio, by the way, folks. And, um, you know, we don't overweight any, any, you know, we're kind of style agnostic. Like Ryan says, mm -hmm. we want to stay diversified. Um, and again, past performance is not indicative of future success. Uh, if technology outperformed, we have another saying, it's called reversion to the mean. All markets revert to the mean. So if something's outperformed, like growth and tech have for like 80% above average, my guess is it's going to languish for a while. We're going to keep a position there. Um, but again, I don't, there's no way to know what's going to bounce most, like just like this year. We didn't know what was going to be up the most. I'm just yeah. happy we have things that are up the most. And now I think to finish off the conversation, you always got to get a crypto question in there. Uh, Jim writes in, do you think crypto ETFs uh, has any position in our portfolio? Or do you agree with Warren B, Warren Buffett's opinion of crypto and his, uh, I think it was his partner, Charlie Munger, who called it rat poison. I'm in the rat poison camp, Bob. What do you think? Well, you know, I love Warren Buffett because he's, he's a, you know, unemotional investor. And he says, you know, what is it, right? He said, you know, I'll buy farmland because you can, you can rent it out to a farmer, right? I'll buy an apartment complex because you can collect rents. I'll buy a stock that pays dividends because it'll pay me dividends or, you know, it'll, it'll pay me in, in earnings. Um, but what do you get when you get crypto, right? I mean, what is it? What's it backed by? Uh, why is it worth anything? You know, I don't want to have anything in your portfolio where I got to depend on a greater fool to buy it to justify me investing it for you. So, and that's basically what it is. Um, you know, I don't understand it. I ask people who invested it. They don't understand it. They just, oh, it's got to be good. It's going up. That's not a good enough reason for me. Give me something solid, something real. Stocks are real. They're backed by real assets. Bonds are backed by real assets. They pay dividends. You know, last I checked, you can't buy lunch with relative performance. You need cash flow. I'm going to stick to that. Cash flow is king. There you go. So um, that looks like the last question. And, and thank you. Uh, we, we have the, the vast majority of you have stayed on for the whole, whole call here. So again, we really appreciate your support. Um, you know, you've been, I can see here, a lot of us just clients have been with us for a very, very long time. Uh, it's been a great ride. And, and of course, we've been through a lot of these before. This isn't our first rodeo. Uh, so hopefully we'll continue to give good guidance like we have in the past. Again, we're very confident in our strategy. Um, we think we are positioned well here, whether we go into recession or not. Um, and you know, we'll continue to reevaluate it. And if we're wrong, we think that we need to make adjustments. We will. Uh, but as you know, we have a great team of fi financial advisors that'll be in touch with you, talking to you on a regular basis. And again, from my perspective, just appreciate all of you and, and thank you for for helping us be such a success over the course of the last 13 or so years we've been in business. And I think there we'll end it. All right, gang, listen, have a great uh, rest of your weekend or start of your weekend. And uh, we'll talk soon, as we always like to say, be bullish. <laughs>